Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe, and we're playing as the Empire of Japan. Last time, we struggled a little bit more with the whole Dai Li crisis investigation, but whatever. And we have a little bit of a, maybe probably a buggy mess with the battle for Italy. It is what it is, because Italy is still pretty independent. Regardless, let's do some focuses and continue down our focus tree. Uh, there's some recommendations. <clears throat> Whether we should choose some sit down with the radicals or keep them under surveillance, which I'll get to in a little bit once we get to that point. But let's see, the military's might, parade in Tokyo, public approval does go up. Hawaii Shoto, let's see, missiles, public approval increases somewhat, that's not bad. Well, let's go ahead and do liberaliz liberaliz liberalizations Pandora's box, my apologies. Since he first ended the diet, Admiral Tsukichi Takaki had chosen his course. Studying with the liberals on many issues, he grew to become their head and eventually their prime minister. His platform is the liberalization of Japan. Why well, can I say that earlier? Economically, socially, and politically. He believes that if Japan is to be prosperous and powerful, cannot leave its citizens behind, the freer the individual is, the better Japan will be. Yet none in the dial, not even among the liberals, that believe that liberalization will be an easier or straightforward task. The activists, the students, and the media provide the Japanese social landscape with an inherent unpredictability. It is a Pandora's box that many prime ministers before Takagi had dared not or wish not to open. However, an admiral needs to be a seasoned seaman. It would not be in his first time sailing under or through uncharted waters, which would be a very, very good thing. So, not a lot of war support, but that's really fine. All right. And these guys are duking it out. Let's see. Ooh, the Pandora's box. Let's read the next focus first. And we can't send volunteers, but let's take a look at these guys first. 94,000 versus 154,000, even though the Divine Mandate has way less factories. 24. You guys have 36. Oh, I'm pretty sure this a very free territory seems to be very strong. They seem to win often or more often now in my campaigns than anyone else. Hmm, straight road. Well, let's get the students to get bolder because we need to do both of these, and then we can eventually power ourselves a little bit more. The students get bolder. The word the world moves along, and Japan is no exception. Student movements take their place. Places across the world calling for the replacement of the old order with the new and upending of old morals for the sake of progress. The liberals of the Diet, under the leadership of, of Takagi, have come to power by capturing the sense of displeasure against the status quo and they have the students to think. However, perhaps the students should not be so quick in their demands for these reforms, although the Prime Minister sympathizes with their cause. The change in demand cannot be accomplished at the, play, at the pace they prescribed. They would have to wait. In the current political climate, when the country worries more than the state of everything else, waiting is the best course of action. <clears throat> and now we'll be playing with fire. Uh, the Prime Minister entered the boardroom to meet with his cabinet, the same as every other couple of weeks. From the start, it was going to be another slog through budget discussions and arguments over what type of reform they should be fighting for. Economic liberalization, as Nakasone and Tadashi always argued for, would be pitted against whatever reform plan they had taken up uh, Zenjiro's interest. He would side with Zenjiro, there would be some arguments, and ultimately they would forge a compromise so that Japan could continue to progress. This procedure had become so commonplace that they would sometimes skip straight ahead to the compromise segment. <clears throat> Takagi took a sheet, his seat, rubbed his eyes, and shoveled the weekly reports until he could see the recent news going on about something. But something was off, though. The cabinet was unusually silent as he was entering, rather than their typical rowdiness, and Jiro was leaning forward, prepared to speak. Strange. So Jiro wasn't the type to jump into arguments, and for some ungodly reason, Kido was missing. Upon making himself comfortable, Takagi, Takagi uh, mentioned for Zenjiro to speak his thoughts. <clears throat> Prime Minister, our intelligence has been noting something. The use has, for some reasons yet unknown, been experiencing an uptick in anti-government behavior now. That isn't abnormal, but the rate and the scale of all of this is bewildering. Across the home isles, or home islands, I, local governments are reporting vandalism and disobedience en masse. Nothing has been concluded, but we suspect that our lack of social reform may have something to do with it. They want us to act as the working theory. <clears throat> Nakasuna banged his fist against the table. He leaned forward, placing his other hand underneath his chin. We're reformers, not puppets of the mob, especially when the mob consists of children. Let the anger boil over. They always do this, get frustrated over the little things, and then explode in a tinter tantrum when they aren't given what they want. I, look, no, let's just move on to something that's more important. Takagi took a moment to contemplate. This wasn't going to work. They were going to have to accede to something, some form of social reform. Takagi looked back towards Nakasuna. The idea of appeasing the masses is a falsity. And we shall see what happens there. So, let's see. Yesterday, we finished with the focus, I believe, the triumph of enterprise. And growth will increase by a lot. Well, it did increase. I wouldn't say by a whole lot. <clears throat> but, we're currently at now, minus 0.9. That is not bad. I mean, obviously, with more expenditures that we got from yesterday, uh, we're at minus 27.13 billion. But that's even after I slashed civilian spending. So, really, budget-wise, we're not looking great. So, yeah. What is that? Wait, do we have the OFN here? 
how quickly rumors spread. Oh, we also got this. So, USA TB Japan Lot Oil. This is after we did the Accords, or it was off screen when I just was running through the last focus. But this, this National Spirit appeared. So, I'm not sure why we get this. This is supposed to be an American National Spirit, I'm pretty sure. Because you're supposed to lose fuel gain, and we lost civilian factories, and then we also get the same thing, so... That's a little buggy. As you can see, Japan's still a little buggy. And we have untapped markets, which isn't bad either. How quickly rumors spread. <clears throat> it was a park bridge as regular as any other, but special for its distance from civilization. Once dusk arrived, and all the park goers had long left since. A few drugs of the crowds came out from the world works and assembled underneath the bridge. Other groups arriving in beat-up cars and the last buses of the night joined their peers below the bridge. More and more came forward, springing outwards from the nearby slums and alleyways. Students, they spread red paint and ribbons between themselves, emulating the socialist revolutionaries and communist freedom fighters of yore. A few select... Firebrands dragged out soap boxes, park benches, and lunch tables prepared to extol the righteousness of their mission. Others let a light barrels fill with, a bu with brush. The chilly night gnawing at their skin, one of the leaders of the student unions, a proverbial veteran of the movement, got up to speak with the mob silencing itself. You know all what we're here to discuss, Kato. Now, I know some of you think this is our opportunity to spring forward to make our presence known and get the government working for true progress. Yet, this is our moment, but I ask of all of you, we must wait a little longer. <clears throat> this is a spark, but the flame has not yet been struck. Of course, this is injustice. The government is out there murdering innocents in the name of racial hygiene and preventing the oppressed from stopping their oppression. That said, a woman getting denied a political position isn't what we need. It isn't powerful enough. We want progress. Blood has to be shed. The moment blood runs in the gutters, and you know they'll take the first chance they can do to kill a kid, we riot. You hear? Uh, we riot, and they'll have to listen. The mob began to slam their fists against their chest with two fingers. They stroked red paint across their cheeks. Their eyes were an inferno, a whirlwind of rage and absolution. With the complexions of martyrs to be, they glanced at one another, wondering who would be the one to die at the hands of the system. The flames of youth are often hard to extinguish. You yeah, know, pretty hard to extinguish. Let's see. The Japanese winter. Admiral Takagi and his liberal government have decided to tell the students that their social agitation must wait. Although they are disappointed and display public disgruntlement with the cabinet's decision, they have complied. Thus begins the Japanese winter, the season where social reforms must wait, whether neither the government nor the state shall pursue any sort of social agenda. For a good reason, the liberals and the student movement share many frustrations with the system. However, the reforms must stick, and that is what the government is preparing to do. The admiral instead chooses to interrupt the term winter differently, where others, especially the young, see it as a season of quiet and non-action. Uh, he views it as a season of preparation. After all, is it not in the winter that those who toil the fields appear prepared to work the soil and plant the seedling when spring arrives? Yeah, let's take a look here. So we have weak support approval. If we do anything, we could hurt ourselves. But we still have a good amount of House of Representatives. <clears throat> Breaching the peace. She marched forward, her face showing into Kato's autobiography. She read over each and every word and phrase, becoming ever more infuriated at the thought of injustice pervasive throughout Japan. She never noticed, or perhaps never let herself see it. Now she remembered the awkward moments or comments made by her mother whenever she stepped out of the bounds and what the government spewed from its outlets about the roles of girls and boys. Indoctrination was, was what it was. Looking up from the autobiography, she formed a wily smile and didn't work. The years of propaganda had failed because she was here, realizing that it was what it was, indoctrination. Suddenly, upon entering a suburban courtyard of her district, she couldn't feel her foot reach the ground. She glanced down, only to find the cold, hard concrete floor of the courtyard meeting her face. She could tell, even in her position, it was another god dang pothole she had just tri tripped in. K Kato's autobiography slipped from her fingers in the panic, and in, in its flight, the false cover she had been using to hide the book's identity flew from the autobiography's confines. Uh, the book slid away far from her grasp. A local policeman, noticing what had happened, began to run over. Dizzily, she attempted to snatch Kato's autobiography, but she wasn't quick enough. The policeman, noticing the cover of the book, stopped his running. She steadied herself, but upon looking back towards the policeman, all she could sense was pain and blunt force. A bone she couldn't tell which cracked, and with the blood sprayed onto the concrete. The policeman, wielding a wooden truncheon, smashed his club onto her forehead. She winced and grabbed at her eye. Through her fingers, a torrent of blood washed onto the floor. She attempted to cry, but the pain of doing so forced her to collapse to the ground. He kept beating her and... <laughs> into the convulsing body of the woman until she laid ma mangled and bloodied in the center of the courtyard. A few passerby desperately attempted to hold him back, but to no avail. Most stayed at arm's length, content to stare instead of intervening. By the end, she was dragged away, handcuffs locked on her disfigured wrists. Blood runs in the gutters. Cool. Alright, 2.26. Increase the uh, GDP. Direct action day. Students once again crowded beneath the park bridge, preparing to plan their next action in the face of the news. This time, things were different. A woman being denied to a political position was a regular act of oppression, no different to the ones they all experienced day after day. The beating and mutilation of an innocent woman for just carrying around the wrong book was the limit of their patience, however. They kicked at the walls, preparing 
preparing their feet for the real thing. Out of the backpacks and purses, they unfurled wooden clubs and antique guns. They were going to fight if need be. A leader of the students' union marched onto the lunch table as it began to speak of the mob silence itself. Let's get this over with. The government and police have transformed this spark into a flame. The police no longer enforce the law on principle. Instead, they're, they're all thugs. Criminals who march across our streets, beating and ma maiming anyone who threatens their hegemony. Uh, hegemony. Or once they stop wrongdoers and misfits, they've transformed into your local death squad, a terrorist organization the government has taught us to call law enforcement. It is in this period of sorrow we must act to get the government working for the greater good. I say, <clears throat> tomorrow, a couple hours after school has ended, let us all congregate by the university's lecture hall. Once we get the chance, we'll take over and proclaim our message, get this out to other universities, at the time we're going to change whether we want it or not. The mob chanted to the tune of revolt. They raised their fists to the cheats and foreheads, to their chests and foreheads, not cheats, for chests and foreheads. A grim determination overtook the crowd, and in between the whispers of phrase of cold, never forgive, never forget. Alrighty. Oh, do we have something here? Increase special. Um, okay, sure, why not? Infantry anti air. Don't mind if we do that first. <clears throat> And grab some water to drink and some coffee as well. All right, let's grab anti air two. The Kaio University incident. They walk through the halls of Kaio University, average students and scholars born into a world of tradition without a notion of revolution or change. All that had changed once a single word had stormed through their minds: an ink, Kato. With Kito, they were at last able to see the injustice that surrounded them, and with knowledge, they could fight that injustice. This generation was not unified, however. Although all followed Kato, this varied from reformers to revolutionaries. One question lingered in the minds of those who would want to change. How do we make the government listen? Protests, riots, or terror? No matter, things had to change somehow, and they would be the ones to bring it about. News was going around that universities across the nation were staging incidents to force the government's hand. Kate... Kayo was special. In that regard, its students were those uplifted from the lower class, the next generation of Parvenus. The student body was itched at the trigger, prepared to take extreme action to bring about Kato's vision. The bell rang, and so the students dragged out backpacks, purses, and packages. What emerged was weaponry, makeshift batons, batons, and bludgeons, even an occasional pistol. They stormed the halls, breaking through into the general offices of the university. The teachers took their chance to evacuate, and the absence of PA systems were left open for use in the student's mission. A grainy, blaring voice spread their message throughout the halls, classrooms, and dormitories of the university. Spread the word, the next generation is taking command of KO University. Our demands are simple, and the living conditions we ask for are matched across the world. First, a repeal of the Kokumin Yosu Yusai Hall. We are not barbarians to freely murder our own citizens over their skills and abilities. Secondly, the government must answer for the beating and maiming of those across the nation who have done nothing but read the works of Shidu Shidzu Kato. Kato's autobiography should be unbound, and the government should rein in the police force. Such acts are crimes against morality. Lastly, the government should, as should have already done already, support the victims of the fallout of the economic crisis. The question remains, until our demands are fulfilled, who do you serve? This is getting dangerously out of hand. Who's going to pay for that? Minus 37 billion. Besides, it should be, I mean, the businessmen kind of screwed over. It's actually, it's not just the businessmen. It was the government, too, that kind of screwed over everyone with the economic collapse, if you think about it. I mean, all that corruption... Um, they're kind of right in saying like, people should pay for that. But we'll see what happens. The response from above. The Prime Minister entered the boardroom from another cabinet meeting, as was usual. He knew something was going on, but not what. The scattered papers in the streets, the glares, and the chants of the youth. Attention was building. He just had to land his finger on the pulse of their animus. He cannot remedy ills if he was ignorant of the facts. Zinjiro's foreboding message of a discontented youth had proven deadly accurate. If Zinjiro looked anxious or prepared to give a speech, Takagi would know something was up. As Takagi threw his briefcase under the boardroom table, he searched for Zinjiro's face. After looking, where was he? He was missing, but at least the rest of the cabinet has arrived, even Kido. Takagi could recognize when something was wrong, since Jiro was not the type to miss his meetings. He shot into the conversation, looking to break the aura of mystery surrounding the past month. Where is Zinjiro? Look, just tell me what is going on. You are my cabinet, are you not? If something is wrong, why have I not heard of it? <clears throat> Kido looked about. The rest of the cabinet were sheepishly silent. Although he didn't want the task of reigning in Takagi, he had become numb to the less enviable aspects of politicking. Uh, Prime Minister Zinjiro is missing because of the students. The youth have staged a series of purposeful incidents across universities all throughout the nation. Most importantly, the students of Kayo University have occupied the school grounds and are refusing to give up until their demands are met. <clears throat> a woman, Shizue Keito, almost made it into the diet, but upon failing, she published her autobiography, which has inspired widespread protests and revolts even. They went through repeal the Kokumin Yusai Ho and a smattering of other demands. Zinjiro is attempting to defuse the situation, and it is my belief that we can still negotiate with the students. Takagi looked around the table. Nakasona, although keeping quiet, was clearly seething with rage. His elbows rested on the table, his hands covered with his mouth. Takagi could tell Nakasona was be 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 blah, blah, blah. begging for an end to this, a crackdown. You're right, Kido, let's, let's negotiate. Let us end this affair before it can begin, the hard way. Uh, well, we still gotta do women's circles and Kato's agitation, so you're right, let's negotiate. Since we're pretty much. This, throughout this campaign, we've been negotiating anyway, so we might as well do that, right? And let's get to the next one, too. 
Akito's agitation. The liberal deputies of the Dai came from many different backgrounds, some of the working class, some for the military, yet none of them more scandalous and groundbreaking than Shizue Akito, the first woman to ever have been elected into the Chamber of Representatives. A feminist and progressive, she has suddenly ref refused to be defined solely by her gender. Joining the Dai was a brave move, but now she associates with the liberals. A firebrand and an activist and agitator to the agitated, she could prove to be crucial in summoning the political will needed to enact uh, Takagi's reforms. And so the Prime Minister accepted her into her into his inner circle. Her and Takagi have many differences between them, but they also share a common goal. Together they shall free them those whose rights, the law, and no social norms have restricted and unite the righteous with their rights. Uh, power increases somewhat. Acting with caution, the grounds of Kaio University scream to the tune of revolution. One of an unsung freedom, a reawakening in a world hostile to its birth. Our freedom is not present, not present since the prim primal earth. Primal? Primeval of Earth, before the arrival of man and the subjugation of soil, an absolute freedom operating as a bubble of violent chaos and, op and liberation of the oppressed, all in one. R fires roared from the courtyards and trash littered the hallways. The machinery was left broken and scattered, the cl classrooms ruined and vandalized. The tune of revolution echoed throughout the night sky to the police barricade th beyond Kyle University's boundaries. There's people marching into the world tonight, ain't scared of a jail, ain't scared of a fight, with bamboo spears and antique guns singing freedom, fight singing freedom songs to the sound of a drum saying, Hitler ain't dead, Hitler ain't de-ed, Hitler ain't dead, but his time has come. Dream like ecstatic clapping and dancing surrounding the fires. Crowds of students are waving red ribbons and makeshift inverted hinomaras. The embers blaze in the night sky. The military police could spot from the cold midnight positions on the streets surrounding Kyo University. Out of the boredom of their duty, a representative of the government arrived, loudspeaker in hand, collection of haphazardly scribbled together notes in the other. He balanced himself on a police barricade, preparing to blare his message across Kyle University. Students of Kyle University, the government of Takagi is sympathetic to your cause. We understand your anger, we understand your frustrations of the lack of substantive social progress, but do not act too rashly. Progress can be made through negotiation, not through violence or destruction. Our representatives will be arriving tomorrow, prepared to forge a compromise with you all. Let us hope they all take the bait. And the public discontent grows. The Prime Minister was informed of a great march on the streets of Tokyo. Consisting of thousands of people, women's groups, and students, activists congregate in the streets of the capital to join the protest born from Kyo University's student unrest. Bearing hundreds of signs and placards, a protest calls for an end to the Kukumen Yusai Ho, as well as various pieces of Tojo era wartime legislation. They march towards the diet, chanting cries of reform like a vast swarm of wasps. The mass gathering of protesters buzzed throughout the city, frothing at the mouth in search for anyone to hold accountable. Takagi sat with his cabinet in his office, the crowds only a few streets away. Law enforcement redirected the masses of the people, but the prime minister knew they'd eventually reach his building. They t he tapped his finger repeatedly on his desk, his eyes fixated on the air in front of him as he thought what about what to do. The room was sweating with a bother worry until foreign, <clears throat> foreign minister Kuronari Tadashi groaned and yelled, We have to do something. These are radicals, prime minister. Who knows what they'll do if we let their grubby hands near our legislature? Look outside, it's treason. <clears throat> Takagi glanced at the irritated man before returning his vision to the thin air. He was still and silent, but swe perf sweating profusely. The faint roar of the protest grew louder and louder as the pro march protests continued, with law enforcement regrouping closer to the cabinet's office. Behind them, they had left destruction in their path, led across the streets and windows smashed near the outbreaks of violence. Glasses with law enforcement became more frequent. Now visible from the windows of Takagi's offices, he peered from behind a curtain and turned back to his cabinet, all eager to hear his next move. Takagi's lips began to tremble as he announced orders to contain the protest beyond the building's doors. Let's hope this doesn't boil over, and we'll see what happens. <clears throat> How's our military doing? Oh, and those people are killing each other over there. Cool. Protest for, or promises, for a committee. Coffee's pretty good. The Prime Minister put his hands down, or together, forming a stance to count them contemplation as he stared down his cabinet, who looked back with equal parts confusion and frustration. He got in this far, and the students had agreed to step down if, and only if, the government took action concerning their core demands of repealing the Koku Min Yosu Yusai Ho. Of course, this wasn't preferable, but at least they agreed to step down at all. Takagi summoned his cabinet for an emergency meeting so that they could agree to what sort of action they should take. Lakasuna would be adamantly opposed, that was. Prime Minister, please. The whole point of this maneuver was bait and switch. They agreed to step down in exchange for us taking action, and once they do step down, then we intervene and put a silent end to those shenanigans. We were never meant to actually fulfill our end of the deal. We agreed to that. This is supposed to teach them a lesson without risk of harm for, fe for fear of further backlash. We've accomplished what we've set out to do. There's no more discussion to be had. Arrest the students, put them up for the crimes they've committed in vandalizing and destroying Kyo University's property, and move on. As I said earlier, we're not puppets of prepubescent mobs. Uh, Nakasuna was at it again. He couldn't accept a single gesture of good faith, any sign that we're not the corrupt backstabbers of... Our youth sees as us. That's how Nakasone wins, compromising in any way such that he doesn't have to compromise. Perhaps no no more. We, we, we will demonstrate to our constituents our character and moral fiber. Besides, perhaps investigating the legitimacy of the Kokumen Yosu Hai, or Ho, would be a bad idea. Nakasone has already decided a committee will be formed to investigate the constitutionality or constitutional legality of the Kokumen Yosu Ho. 
You say hell. If we are not to act, the youth will view us as a backstabbers. Protests and perhaps more revolts will arise across the nation. This is at the least we can do. The only further discussion left for us is, to, is this. How shall we put this committee into practice? And we need more tanks. Oh yeah, we definitely need more tanks. Oh my goodness. What happened to our factories? The consequences of free speech. Now, let's do that. Let's do that too. Because we need actually make, to make more stuff. What is going on? We must, we must lost, lost a lot of military factories. So... The papers turned to the streets, and the coating lamp holes, the doors of businesses and unprotected cars. Cato had returned, an overarching specter whipping excitement and hope into the winds of the home islands. Takagi's piecemeal and enthusiastic pace of social reform had not, as it turned out, put an end to the youth movement's desire for progress. The Kyo University incident was what was on the headlines, a betrayal as it was painted. The students had only wanted a few reforms, most of all the repeal of the Koku Min Yosu Ho. Yusai Ho, which continued to see through that supposed inferiors were murdered or sterilized. Takagi's band-aid remedy for the to the deaths of innocents was not, in retrospect, a gentle way to approach the issue. Sure, a committee was formed to question the legality of the Kokumen Yosai Ho, but did nothing and continued to, continued to do nothing. Kato wrote a scathing op-ed in all mainstream newspapers who were all too happy to accept the circulation of the papers for free. It was on everyone's minds, the youth movement was ever more enraged, and Takagi could not continue to prevent the march of social progress. Yochi... Uh, uh, Soki Cho... Soki Cho... Takagi claims to be the leader of the liberal faction of the Yoku Sankai, and his actions were painted with the colors of blind reaction and the blood of the honorable. Every day, man, woman, or child is forever more deprived of a future wherein they can birth life from their own, all due to a label of inferiority gifted to them by our government. Every day, thousands of infants, innocent souls just given consciousness are forcibly deprived of their parents to be exterminated in mass in the fires of our government's bloodlust. I call upon all of you good souls resist. Do not be silent when the government is freely throwing around the designation of life, undeserving of life, to the poor and guiltless. Some people will never be pleased. <clears throat> cool. And we should probably have women's circles next. One of the most crucial yet overlooked aspects of the coming social reordering of Japanese society is the role of women. As Shizua Kato often reminds the liberals, this is not a society of men and men only. Women can vote, and the Constitution bestows upon them the rights that are equals of those of men. Yet there remains an indivisible veil that separates both sexes from true equality. Matters such as pay, social roles, and the recurrent notion that a wife should submit to her husband have damaged the standing of women ever since the Maiji Restoration, or perhaps a long time before. Mobilizing the female sex into political consciousness should be Shizua Kato's policy is a key member of the liberal clique. From then on, this shall serve as a keystone of the Takagi administration's social reforms. If half of Japan is with the cabinet, who shall unseat it? Maybe the other half. I don't know. Let's see. Let's get the technology first, and then we'll do the straight road. Let's see. We are doing... Oh, battleships? Sure, why not? Straight road all across the streets. Paper littered the roads. Newspaper clippings. Books, pages. Slogans painted upon the bed sheets in the white of the Onomaru. They fly on the breeze, and their ink blotches as they float throughout the streams and canals of inner Japan. <clears throat> There had been no storm, nor this was an intentional act of mass vandalism. It only took a few days, and in, in that time, a typhoon of the mind crashed upon Japanese society, or more accurately, a cast of Japanese social hierarchy. The name had not been pierced to the ears of Prime Minister Takagi or the Minister of Finance of Nakasona, but the young radical poor and exiled heard it, and it only. It repeated over and over again in whispers and thoughts. It burned itself into the consciousness of the lower class, and with every repetition, a flame of rage and injustice fueled Kato, Kato, Kato. Shizua Kato was a self-made woman, a widely and cunning operator of Japanese blood court. Even without political office, she had fought for the feminist cause from reproductive rights to the destruction of gender norms entrenched in Japanese society. She came so close to the greatest goal of a woman can aspire to a political position in the government. But her efforts failed. A single woman cannot be beat society and culture of millions, her critics said. So she made her next goal to beat the society and culture of millions. Her autobiography had been released detailing her progress so far and the regressive injustice of the systems that she fights. It did, didn't take long for the work to be unbanned, to be banned, but it also didn't take much to look around to see that the banning of the book hadn't stopped its movement. Even as an underground publication, it is a bestseller and can be found hidden in backpacks, secluded corners, and storerooms across the nation. The work has started widespread, albeit small protests, all from fighting for Kato's largest and most ambitious goal, the repeal of the Koku Min Yosai Ho. Uh, the National Ed Eugenics Law, which had cemented eugenics, the restriction of birth control access, and the sterilization of inferiors as a government policy since the 40s. Quite the read, to say the least. Very cool. Awesome. Oh, and there, oh, wow. That's a very that's a very dark part of Russia, I guess you could say. It's hard to see that compared to the sea. I mean, look, how, look at the sea compared to the Siberian Free Territory. It's almost one. They're so dark. Also, I think someone said a long time ago, I think I already addressed the comment, but like, look at the culture of Slovenia. Well, Ljubljana, Ljubljana here is Slovenian, but of course, Kranish is a product of German colonization of Karnola. So, Onto Stiermark. So, there is Slovenia. It's Kranish, so it is what it is. Ljubljana, women's circles. 
and then we'll have the matter of internal internal security. From the outset, the Prime Minister has been straightforward in his goal. Reform Japanese society in order to keep up with the rest of the world. All the liberals support this, although in different ways. Some, such as Nakasone, recommend the liberalization of J the Japanese economy. Of others, such as Shizu Kato and her followers, agitate for a free freer and more functional Japan, one that is free from the traditionalist and bigoted riot roots. As the captain of the ship, the Admiral Takagi sympathizes with both. However, the voyage ahead is so far. He can ill afford a gap in his ranks with the conservatives, keto or even reform bureaucrats could exploit. He will have to decide between the two eventually. For now, he shall make overtures towards both, doing what he can to reconcile the wings of one with one another. The Admiral's captained many a rowdy ship and come out on top. So we'll see what happens. And special forces deployment? Sure, why not? Level 5 is fine with me. Get it higher, 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 and... Go ahead and slash more. Civilian. Oh, okay, that's not too bad. If we slash the civilian spending, we get like three billion more in deficit. So we could. But how's our construction going right now? It's going okay. You know what? We're gonna slash it anyways for now. We're gonna lose political power. Oh, that's actually much better. But once we hit the 70s, because we're very close to the 70s right now, we will get the research that gives us more max factories in a state, and then I won't slash it anymore. So we can build more civilian factories and emergency security meeting. Takagi met with. Zenjiro and Kido, excluding Nakasone from the meeting. Oh, that's not cool. Same as before, go easy on students and crack them down. So we had to make a choice now. So, at the time of this recording, we have comments to get through. Normally, I like addressing comments earlier, but whatever. So, there's support for both sides, and ultimately, it came down to the influence of the likes of each side's comments. So, the winner between sitting down with the radicals or keeping them under surveillance was sit down with the radicals. Now, overall, there's more comments and influence for this one, and it does make a little bit more sense to go down with sitting down with the radicals. Since we're liberalizing, we're, we're really focused on more compromising. So that's the way we got to go for now. But if you want to read about keeping them under surveillance, go right ahead, as well as preempt the most radical. So sit down this time properly, and we will get sit down with the radicals. There we go. Also, there's another comment that Nakasona, he's our finance minister, He's actually a real person. He was a real person. He, at the time of this recording, he died literally less than one year ago. So thank you to whoever left that comment from the, the, yesterday's video. That was actually really cool. He died in November 2019. Late November. So actually, right now in game, it's very close to where he died. So that's actually really, really cool. He's a very interesting fellow. But the hardliners protest. People of the many backgrounds comprise a liberal clique. But there's no place where this contrast is more pronounced than between the radicals and hardliners. The former comes from feminists, social liberals, and the students yearning for regressive causes to be enacted across the country. The latter assembles itself from the middle class, those who believe that the liberalization of the Japanese economy would naturally lead to a better, more equal Japan. When the government sided with the radicals, the hardliners rose up in protest, threatening to cross the branch to halt any progressive laws. The prime minister shall come out and personally stop these defections to the rival political factions, whether through earnest, good faith, pleading, or shadier methods. <clears throat> the liberal clique is one, and one it shall remain. If they want support for the causes, we will give it to give it for this. It is perhaps the most the moment that these classical liberals will learn that there is no such thing as a free lunch. You are with us, or you are against us. So we get lose faction support somewhat, while the reformers get even more support. So. And we have another event here, and should come up any second now. An unexpected term. Home minister, home minister, minister Horiki Horikiri had not visited a university in some time. It had been a good few years since his days at Tokyo Imperial University, and even those buildings have been rebuilt 40 years ago. Much had changed since those days. When Prime Minister Takagi had appointed him to meet with his protesting students, Horikiri had gladly accepted that the Home Minister had little faith in their commitments to the protest and was sure they would back down upon hearing him speak. The Home Minister was led to a stage in the university's main hall, who was greeted by the sight of several hundred students. I stand before you today as an emissary of the Prime Minister. He has asked me to explain the circumstances regarding the commission to you. A murmur began to spread around the crowd, which uh, Horikiri allowed to simmer for a moment before continuing. The commission is engaged in matters of great importance to the nation. It must be allowed to operate under disturb. Those not educated to speak on matters such as the Koku Men Yos I thought it was Yosaiho. The Prime Minister asked that you remain peaceful and civ before Horikiri could finish his sentence. He was cut off by a voice in the crowd. Why should we not be allowed to participate? We only ask to be included in matters that shape our future that we feel strongly about. The government will have to put up with us or until our demands are met. The student was met with applause from his fellows. Your concerns have been noted, but the decisions concerning your involvement have already been made. You must accept this. Horikiri seems to only embolden the students further each time he refuses their demands. Each voice in the crowd was received with great praise and to, uh, while he was met with silence. Eventually, he was met with no choice but to offer them his word that he would once again bring their demands before the government. He only hoped that a small ch victory would not give them the taste for even more change. Give them an inch and they'll ask for a mile. That's why you sometimes don't give people what they want immediately. You can't give them stuff immediately. Sometimes you can. It's really good if you can, but sometimes you gotta look at the context of the situation. 
But let's finish off our naval doctrine. Carrier organization, we gotta go with carriers. Yep. Bastions on the sea. Thank you very much. Securing a back channel in the Prime Minister's office, Sakagi and Kido sat staring at each other in silence. The Prime Minister was tired and apprehensive. He sighed in his chair and threw himself forward to lean over from behind his desk. Kido, while welcoming this interaction, was seemingly unaware of the desperate fatigue smeared over Takagi's face and simply wished to hear the Prime Minister's offer. The Prime Minister sighed again and threw a pen across his desk to initiate the potentially exhausting interaction. Kido, you and I are in some trouble we don't act soon. Kishi's up to something, and if he plays his cards right, we may be outnumbered in the dive. You know exactly where we will end up if we let this happen. Kido adjusted the glasses that sat on his nose, and he nodded whilst listening to the Prime Minister's request. Thoroughly impressed, Kido brandished a grin and spoke with a fresh optimism, approving of Takaki's request. He began to blabber about who he will ring and speak to, and with each breath he took Takagi's failed, and Takagi failed to interrupt him. Unbeknownst... To Takeda, the Prime Minister's fury bubbled up with each word he uttered. <clears throat> a civil servant burst through the office door carrying sheets of paper for the Prime Minister, and Takagi's fiery, piercing gaze melted him. The servant retreated in seconds, and Takagi returned his furious attention to an intimidated Takeda who had curled up in his chair. Taking a breath and keeping his cool, he spoke to Kido with a slower yet firm tone. I don't think you understand. We will be out of here in weeks if you and I don't get things done. Kido gulped, having never seen Takagi this vexed before, and shook his hand before discussing things further. Let us hope the Imperial hand can be used in our favor. Let us hope so. Crisis in Nanjing. Time to shake things up. Oh boy. What is going on in Nanjing? Military austerity. Oh boy. And that's all pretty good. Keep slashing the debt. That's good, 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 good. I was just looking. We were only building three, almost four some, so that's okay. It's not great. You can't please everyone. Takagi met with Kishi Nosub. Nobusake, a prominent MP in the National Diet in a garden not too distant from the Prime Minister's estate. They strolled through the green gardens and caught up about personal affairs, approaching a wooden bench to sit and watch the birds while discussing various events across the globe. The two men nodded and agreed with one another on multiple issues and chuckled about, e about each other, Yushi pausing with a brief and awkward silence between each sentence. Suddenly, Kishi turned towards the Prime Minister and gave him a certain look. Look. I know who you're talking to, he said bluntly. The student leader is becoming more obvious. Takagi's eyes widened and his mouth went dry, but he did not let any sign of weakness show. He turned his head towards Kishi and looked uh, with a look of disapproval, pressuring him to apologize for his deceitful claims. Kishi, unbothered by the Prime Minister's appearance, smirked silently, before pulling a handkerchief from his pocket to wipe his nose. He looked back towards the serene gardens for a moment and then uttered to Takagi, Don't try to hide it from me, provoking the Prime Minister further. Mr. Kishi, you hope you're not planning anything malevolent, remarked Takagi, prying for more information from his acquiescence or acquaintance. Kishi replied after a moment, gazing into the gardens with graceful fountains. Mr. Prime Minister, what I think remains with me as a law-abiding citizen, all I say is to be careful with, with what you bring up to the diet. The protests are clearly watched, closely watched, but you are watched more so, a relic of the past. He may be right. Um, I don't think it really matters which one we choose, so he may be right. I didn't realize we could do colonial reforms as well as the Koku Men Yosai Ho. Ooh. A soft victory might not be bad. I do want to get some more war sport though, so... And we can help these guys out, out as well. Pan-Asianist propaganda? Hmm. The silencing of activism? Cato to the table. It probably makes more sense if we do Cato to, to the table, so... We're going to lose weekly stability though, which is not great. The riots calmed. Our legitimacy shattered. Well, that doesn't seem very good. Protect the status quo. Nakasona solution. Colonial reforms, untapped riches. I like that. Jewel the Empire. Hmm. I'll do pan Asianist propaganda first. The fraternity of nations across Asia has been at the center of our tension since the early Showa era. Millions of men took up arms and gave their lives for the liberation of Asia, and today we live in an age of prosperity which our dead have built for us. With a new generation born after the Greater East Asian War and living free from foreign occupation, it is paramount we do not forget the honor of pan Asian brotherhood. Thus, from this day forward, we remind our children that the peace in Asia was secured under immense pressure and agonizing hardship, and the passionate fraternity between brilliant nations has brought us liberation from foreign domination. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it depends on how you look at it. Because it really depends on how you look at it. So, terrorist attack in Italy. Oh, a young democracy threatened by radicalism. The Piazza Fontana. Uh, sure. Why not? At dawn, it's not just the night that dies, it is man and it is becoming. The warm blood staining the pavement is a word that is just starting. It's a word that's just starting. No. Hot autumn ends. Oh, it is December 20th, so. Boots on the ground. The Arab War. Oh. Do we get involved in naval exercises in the Japanese Ocean? Sure, why not? Pan-Asian propaganda? 
Ooh, I don't want to increase my debt. Let's go with the military's might. The military is a symbol of the Emperor's peace over Asia. There's a secret institution in Japanese society from the days of Yamagata to the Great East Asian War. The Japanese military has been characterized as strong, authoritative, and most importantly, subordinate to the Emperor. Thundering and determined, the dedication of the military to preserving the Empire is unmatched in intensity and vigor. We cannot let this undying passion go to waste, and showcasing the pride in this, the image of the Imperial Armed Forces can work in our favor. Exercising the might and will of the Empire of Japan may be just the thing we need to impress our allies and intimidate our foes, humbling all those who dare question our primacy. Let's see. Um, sure. Why not? What am I else am I going to do with political power for now? I'm going to do the daily conference or the crisis thing? Nah. Well, we have 382 factories. I prefer 400, but hey, we'll work with whatever we got. Oh, that income rate. How's our poverty and stuff doing, actually? Oh, we are. We might actually get down a lower level of profession, army professionalism to widespread cronyism, which is not good for us. All right. So the OBS is on midway. Let's do this one. In order to maintain, oh, actually, public approval. Actually, how, what is our public approval right now? Before we do that one, it's actually pretty high. So we can do that one. In order to maintain the prestige of the Imperial Japanese Army, we, we must remind our citizens of the Empire that the IJA's vital role in protecting Asia. Many of Tokyo's salarymen, housewives, and students have read of military success and listened to military stories without witnessing the nobility of the institution itself. So, to instill greater pride in the Japanese public, thousands of our brave soldiers will march down the streets of Tokyo, accompanied by marching bands, waving banners, and great cheering crowds. With such marvelous energy and zeal, our soldiers are sure to be hailed as mighty and honorable servants of the Emperor, and the public will cry out with enthusiastic support for our armed forces. Great. I do want to get down to this finish this focus tree first and then kind of finish the center branch as the last thing to do because this is more story based and after we do this things could happen after that so and if we go down this tree I don't think this will change too much but let's do our technology first and then read another focus all right it's almost 1970 it is 1970 happy new year happy tech new decade well it's kind of a new decade get civilian construction it's only five percent more max factories you can see but that's all right get down the debt a little bit more thank you very good and we'll do air bases on Midway. Our decision to build air bases on Midway was motivated by aggression from our neighbors across the Pacific, the Americans. So ignorant and pig faced, is unable to accept his own negotiating peace, or negotiated peace. Uh, in his own con incoherent rattling for war, he calls for an end to the Emperor's peace over these oceans to defend against his violent irritation. We will construct great airfields and hangars to house entire squadrons of planes to zoom over the vast Pacific skies. With a base in such a central and strategically advantageous position, the Imperial Armed Forces will have the ability to thrash the fool who dares sail into Japanese territory. While we will not shame our people with pointless conflict now, the world shall know that the Empire of Japan will not cower in the face of foreign invasion. Happy 1970, everyone. I hope you're having a great year. Let's grab some of that, because we can. And then we're going to grab some of this, because we can also do that, too. Oh, we get 10% more max factories in the state. Yes, please. What can we do over here? Increase special... Sure, why not? I don't think we can get, really get involved here, so hopefully we can't. I'm not really interested in getting involved in Oman. Oh, he's kind of speaking. Abdul Rahman Al Bakir. Very cool. And for this one, we shall do exercise Arashi. The invisible fleets of the Imperial Japanese Navy rule over the Pacific, crashing over the foamy waves and choppy eastern waters. At the order of the Prime Minister, we shall deploy these indomitable fleets across oceans to the four corners of the Pacific, stretching our reach from Fiji to the Bering Straits. As we extend our fleets' reach and project our power half across the globe, the world shall sit and watch as we flex our naval muscles. The shock of the artillery fire will tumble through the air as fighters soar off the, off the deck of colossal aircraft carriers buzzing across the skies of our conquered oceans. We shall show our neighbors that Japan commands the seas and the Empire's rule over the oceans Shall not be questioned. Good. Basic battleship holes. Nice. Let's keep doing some research. Integrated circuit computing. Very good. Arashi. Cool. That's nice. Almost 402 billion. Not bad. Hopefully we can get at least a positive amount of growth. That'd be pretty good. So. Oh, and you guys are falling apart too, huh? Well, I can't be bothered with them. Improved strategic deterrence. The mightiest arms in our arsenal are reserved for the mightiest of our enemies, the Americans and the Germans. Once a rival, once an ally, both of these adversaries champ for our demise and in the end of the Emperor's peace. Therefore, we have deemed it necessary that our nuclear capabilities to defend Asia will be at their peak. In order, we will order the research, development, and deployment of the most modern nuclear weapons and technologies across the Empire. We refuse to be held hostage by our enemies' calls to war and claims of armament, and so we must unveil our arsenal so that they, too, will consider threats of retaliation and thermonuclear destruction. I love thermonuclear destruction. Anything here? How, when's the next research going to be done? Oh, we got quite a few weeks. Sure, why not? The trouble in the West. Well, the Empire of the Rising Sun has little interest in the ridiculous machinations of the Reich and the nations it consorts with. The new stream is broad, nonetheless worrying for the Emperor and his court. Germany marches anew now against the government of Krim, and the 
<clears throat> news seems grim. Just as they had done decades ago, the Germans struck with fear, hoping to rapidly destroy and annihilate the country and the people they call enemies. The army has been very clear on what they propose. Soldiers should be sent to advise the weaker armies are the government to crim in their, in their, or crim in their war and to strike a brutal blow against the far inferior men of Germany on the ground. The Navy's proposal is also to harm the German war machine at its source, but in a manner less blatant. They propose that we simply send arms of, instead of men and allow our guns to do the work for us. Still, some worry about the costs associated with such an action and the annoyance that would inevitably come from poking at the Germans. The issue has been ultimately left up to the choice of the Prime Minister. Now, if you're like me and you don't know what the crim was, and I had to look this up, it's Crimea. <clears throat> Under Dernitz. Yep, Dernitz. And they've no focus tree, so the army's planning to sound, send some guns, and we give them some technology too. Or a caution the navy, or use the navy, or an empire do not care for gaijin squabbles. Let's just send men and materials immediately. Let's see what happens, because they're under Borman or Goring? It was Goring. <clears throat> and luckily, he still has focuses to do, and he can still do a lot more stuff. So, we'll let them keep doing whatever they want to do. And hopefully he'll do okay. Hopefully he'll go on a rampage, actually. I want to see him on a rampage. Oh, look. Oh, that just... Oh, War Plan A. Oh, look. They're doing out of government. Our great English friends. Orchestrated riots. Oh, they're going to hurt the English. And produce strategic deter deterrence. Cool. And let's go ahead and do the Steel Sun Rises. I like a steel blade, the Imperial Armed Forces are unbroken by the enemy, sealing the choppiest of seas and fighting the toughest of battles. Even in relative peace, the glory of our service to the Empire has been enshrined across the Empire. Children wave Imperial banners and crowds that cheer upon witnessing the honor of our seamen or servicemen defending the Empire and Asia from foreign aggression. A rejuvenated sense of pride shimmers throughout the Empire, and the people rejoice to know that our country is not just safe, but prepared to fight in the name of the Emperor if so he wishes. <clears throat> our great navy crashes throughout the oceans to guard from foreign invasion, while our men stand proud across the empire to preserve the existing peace. The flag of the rising sun weighs higher in the air than ever before. Not only is it a symbol of our nation's pride, but as a reminder to the world that Japan is here to stay. Oh, that's a lot more political power. Which I'm just going to spend and blow on regular force deployment. Because why the heck not? Nice. Minus point nine. Oh, I hope we can still improve that. Oh, and... <laughs> oh, uh, Theo... Theodor Reichshofen, right? Theodor... Oh, well, that's sad. We sent them guns and material and men, but it was all for naught, unfortunately. Investments in Azad Hind. The Azad Hind, our ally in the Indian subcontinent, stands a testament to the virtues of Pan-Asian thought. In the spirit of Pan-Asian fraternity, we decided to show our patronage and solidarity to our brothers in Bengal. By directing foreign investments, development loans, and other forms of economic assistance to the government of free India, we hope to encourage a drive to improving the living standards and economic performance. By setting up a strong and reliable Indian ally, our government can retain its pan-Asian appearance, as we aid the brother nations across Asia and also bolster the ranks with another client state subordinate to the Emperor's will. Now, I chose this one last just because well, I don't like more debt. So, that's literally why I chose that last. Uh, that's still not bad. How is this looking? One, two, three, four, five. Five-ish. We'll, we'll keep it like that. And maybe we will also, once eventually we can do so, build a nuclear reactor, maybe? Maybe not? Cool. The Middle East beckons. Recent Zaibatsu interest has drawn a government's attention to the Italian corporations, corporations in the Persian Gulf, where oil is cheap and luxuries are plenty. In such a small sliver of land with such great yet untapped potential, economic investment and influence can benefit the Empire of Japan immensely. With Japanese economy's ascendancy in these markets, the region has the potential to be a key location for our own political interests. Indeed, sinking the teeth of Japanese capital into these markets and anchoring our influence across the Gulf region can extend our influence across the globe, strengthening national competitiveness and building international leverage. Nice. Debt will rise or... Oh, oh, oh we actually have some... There you go. National debt, not bad. Still, not too bad, actually. Not bad at all. Sure, why not? Special Forces deployment? Why not? And that's all victory. Oh, but we'll do that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. We got this one done. Let's see, cap growth, output, output. Retention, cap growth, base. Uh, base is okay. Let's grab this one. Flexible automation techniques. And let's go and do this one. Let's build up. Oh, oh yes, we got a lot more room. Let's build up two reactors, because nothing's wrong with building up in F where Fukushima will be eventually. Nothing bad could happen there eventually. And I'll actually build up like two more military factories as well, because we could use a few more factories. So let's do that. And then we'll come back here and do this area too. So. Nice. And we'll save that for now. 
and let's read about the soft victory. Our government has pursued many campaigns and drives internationally to exhibit the cultural acts, cultural capital of Japan as benefactors and patrons of our Asian brothers. Our efforts to aid our allies from Calcutta to the heart of being have proven fruitful and ultimately successful in showing the world the generous nature of our empire. Moreover, with a recent interest and investment outside the sphere, our geopolitical muscles beginning to match our economic might as we continue to leverage our cultural, our strong cultural assets to improve our overall soft power. With the Prime Minister's recent international showcase of all things Japanese, all eyes and hearts are now turning towards the land of the rising sun. Very nice. And more technology done? That'll just help us show the world how strong we truly are. Resource extraction gain? Don't mind if we do. And we're going to do this as well. Nice. Air detection. Bastions on the sea. And we're done with our naval doctrine. Great. And we have a lot of naval stuff we could do. But let's go ahead and get some better artillery. Oh, we already did that. We're already ahead of time. Great. Let's get some better light aircraft. Better helicopters. Advanced scout helis. And we'll do some probably advanced truth scouts as well. So after this... Ooh... Togura has gone. Let's do the Kokumin Yosai Ho. Public opposition to our administration, both from the radical left-wing students and the traditional monks and clergy, is united in a singular purpose. The revision of the Kokumin Yosai Ho, or the National Eugenics Law, signed into law by the Kono administration in 1940. The student movement, which Shidze Kato has become the leading figure of, opposes the law due to concerns over the immorality of eugenics and infringements of human rights, while elements of the clergy oppose the law due to its violation of the sanctity of Japanese life. Day by day, popular discontent over the law increases, and if our worst fears are to be assumed, their discontent will only spill over to other pieces of legislation which favor the status quo. Our administration is at a crossroads. Do we risk pushing back action on the law for a minimal political gain, or do we listen to our pillars of our public support and see if we can come to terms with their radicalism? Eugenics? What's wrong with eugenics? Nothing what's wrong with eugenics. What are you talking about? Eugenics? What? Nothing wrong or bad could ever come out of that. No. <laughs> oh, eugenics. Oh, we can't make a lot of stuff. That's fine. Let's see. Actually, triangular. I think we're using this as military police. So, I think I set that up earlier. Yeah, we are using the triangular one for military police, which is fine. We took off support companies, which is good. And the root of the problem: the cabinet sat in a boardroom and passed about leaflets containing excerpts from the student manifestos currently circulating around the areas afflicted by protests. The cheap yellowish yellow light bulb that hung above the man buzz is afflicted to the colorful flyers. The hum drilled into their minds, driving them insane under the mounting pressure of civil unrest in the streets of Japan. Takagi dashed some of the flyers in front of him and fell back in his chair, rocking forward and back in an attempt to keep himself calm. Kido, sifting through the sheets and sheets of paper, took off his glasses and pinched the bridge of his nose. He cleared his throat and they spoke to the Prime Minister. They're all saying the same thing. They want incomprehensible and revolutionary change. A deafening silence followed, only broken by the sound of an Increasing paper and the occasional sigh of a minister. Nakasona, with tired eyes and sweat clinging to the side, inside of his suit, groaned to Takagi, noting that their demands were outrageous and could never be satisfied. Takagi raised his brow, not acknowledging the rationality of the radicals put things in his favor, but he was not comforted, comforted to be in such a precarious position. The cabinet stayed in the boardroom into the late hours of the night, eventually stripping down their overcoats and blazers to work with rolled-up sleeves and loosened ties. As the clock struck two in the morning, they climbed to a consensus. The man gazed at the piles and piles of pages they had gone through and noted this quarrel of what the protesters demanded. Fix economy or repeal the Kokumin Yosai Ho. Takagi, dwarfed by the sheer amount of material, stood back in awe and understood that either the crisis must be dealt with soon or else he would be finally their kryptonite. Oh, and we have to the events, so. Oh, we don't get to choose. So, the colonial reform. The Empire of Japan, a mighty and ancient nation, wields an empire stretching the, across the Pacific that towers over her enemies and allies. However, the imperial system of administration has recently grown clunky, overly bureaucratic, and de in desperate need of reform. The Prime Minister and his cabinet were committed to the strengthening and preservation of our powerful empires began drafting plans for sweeping reforms. The, with the Pacific possessions running up costs and remaining undeveloped and neighboring colony colonies in Chozon and Taiwan in need of an administrative overhaul, we carry the great burden of deciding how the imperial system is to change. Very cool. Actually, is there anything here else that could help us improve suppression? We want more suppression, not less. Nope, nothing there. Is there anything here that gives us more? I, mean, I guess using tanks would not be bad. It does give us a little bit more armor. Actually, armor does help with suppression, doesn't it? Ooh. Well, let's see what happens. What is this? Ooh, budget? Oh, that's leaving less money now. Oh, I don't like that. <clears throat> Regular forces? Special forces? Sure, why not? Spend the political power, because we can. And we should get an event very soon. A spanner in the works. The cabinet had gathered the prime ministers of the state for drinks in the afternoon, taking a break from official appearances, but still hard at work discussing policy as a union. Nakasone, of somewhat somewhat springing his step, poured glasses of water for the prime minister and the others to cool him down, listening to tunes on the radio. As he merrily approached Zunjiro, the security minister scowled and muttered, "What makes you so bloody zany? Zany?" Condemning Nakasone's mood and reducing him to a quiet show of his cheerful self. <clears throat> 
Kido sprawled out on a leather chair, sat back and engaged with Takagi in discussing any possible outcome of future efforts to legislate and ignore the agenda of his protesters. The Prime Minister chuckled, cynical the dad's attention to the detail, and shook his head. Kido nodded, understanding of Takagi's pains, and began to involve Nakasuna and Tadashi in the discussions between the five of them. Soon after, a buzz Dis disrupted the music on the radio, and Nakasuna dragged himself from the seat to turn it off. At the very last moment, Takagi whipped his head around and demanded Nakasuna turn the volume up. The five sat there and listened, not quite knowing what to expect, and all of them left from their positions upon hearing the news. A huge protest uh, with thousands of atten attendees had gathered in the Tokyo suburbs, sur suburbs, sounding more radical than before. The Prime Minister's eyes widened as he looked back at Kido, and Nakasuna's head fell into his hands, calling for Zajiro to get a hold of the head of the Tokyo's law enforcement. A cold sweat limp Climbed up to Kagi's back, his face grew red with worry. We need breathing room now. Well, we'll see what happens. As we're doing colonial reform. Hey, we finally got 400 factories. Nice. For the sake of national security. Ooh, actually, let's research first. I like to research. Uh, we can't do that one. It's just way too ahead of time. Land auction, of course, is done as well, which is nice. Naval stuff, helicopter stuff. Let's grab something else. Ah, light aircraft. Why not? Advanced jet fighters. The Prime Minister sat in his estate with Kido and Zenjiro, eating lavish dishes of fresh fish and vegetables. They sat at a fine clothed table surrounded by two servants who repeatedly refilled Kido's glass with wine and occasionally went off to return with more extravagant meals for the men. Takagi was starving and any food would be good enough to get him thinking straight again. The three made the occasional comment about their lunch as they chewed through the expensive delicacies until Takagi began to make a point of his position as Prime Minister. Kido and Zenjiro listened direct diligently to the Prime Minister who sat explaining his dilemmas as the two to the two whilst eating his sea urchin and fresh salmon. He debated about putting an end to the protest once and for all, much to Zenjiro's surprise, and asked if suppression would, drove, would drown out the radical cries. Talking of police raids and mass arrests, the Prime Minister arrested jeopardizing his entire support base and in his impassioned ramblings. Zenjiro stopped eating and listened very carefully to him, momentarily glancing over Akito, who was lost for words at the sheer nature of Takagi's argument. After taking a sip of water, Takagi then continued to contemplate, now wondering if he should simply invite Kato over for an honest discussion. The Prime Minister looked towards Kito while rambling, and Zenjiro attempted to hold back a snicker. Kito kicked him from under the table and conti continued to pay attention to a reflecting Takagi. He nodded and returned one word replies to the Prime Minister, attempting to hide his hesitance under a blanket of cool approval. Takagi then leaned back in his chair, signaling for another glass of water, and pondered for a while what would be the right choice. Perhaps, more importantly, what would he want to be remembered as? Popular support is like a hydro cut off one head and two will take his place? Or root out the, the position poison? I kind of want to do silencing the activism, but, oh, weekly support goes, weekly stability goes down by 4%, but you get the same thing over here, actually just minus 2%, so, uh, well, we got to do K to the table, that just makes more sense for us, if you want to read about this, go right ahead, but, let's go on and move, and do other things once we get the next focus available, brawl with the conservatives, Keto's connections, we'll probably do that one, it seems as uh, though appointing Kido Koichi, Koichi Kido to a cabinet has been a wise investment, as visibly demonstrated through his connections in the House of Peers and the Privy Council. What will require of him now may be one of the most difficult tasks for the great statesman yet, pressuring the House of Peers to support a radical social reform, one that comes from a known dissident. If we secure the noble support, gliding past opposition to Kato's social reforms would be breeze. If we don't, however, we would be in a for a tough time. Kido will have to pull almost every political trick in the book, from blackmail to old favorites, to secure their support. Trouble in the West. While the Empire... Uh, the Rising Sun has little interest in the ridiculous machinations of the Reich and nations it consorts with. The news from the broad is nonetheless worrying for the Empire and the court. Oh, now, basically the same thing as we have said before. Uh, well, I'm not going to finish this paragraph, but the army has been very clear on what they propose. Soldiers should be sent to advise the weaker armies of the English military commanding the war and strike a brutal blow against the far inferior men of the Germany on the ground. The Navy has also proposed some things as well. Uh, we'll help out the English. Why not? The army. So, Germany's on warpath. It's interesting that we get like, decisions or events regarding them and goring, trying to, like, take everyone out. Which I think is kind of cool that we get events about, but I don't think there's that much we can really do about it, but close the curtains. Dugagi and his cabinet hunkered down in a boardroom with sheets of paper sprawled across the various tables they sat at. Lumping piles of folders, dossiers, and reports on, into different piles, and extracting form charts of evidence and statistics. They were working towards creating a comprehensive plan for the reformation of Japan's colonial holdings. Each minister had already taken off their suit jackets and loosened their tie. They were hard at work, often sprawled across the floor to link distant clips of evidence with various sheets of statistics under certain file names. The complicated process took marvelous amounts of energy from each other, but they had, by early hours of the morning, they had completed the goal they had set out to achieve. Success, gentlemen. Nice. Four into two factories. Not bad. Even better. So we should get these done soon enough and in our ivory boiler room. The Prime Minister was discussing the scope of colonial reform with his cabinet had reached a point of contention with members of his government. They had blickered, bickered for almost 40 minutes over the degree of autonomy delegated to each colony and things were quickly getting personal. In a moment of rage, the Prime Minister lashed out his finger and aimed it at Zenjiro's face, demanding the apologies 
or, or he apologized for accusing the Prime Minister of narcissism. His face was red and flustered, frustrated at the arguments between the squabbling men in charge of government affairs. Sinjiro, after tense moment of silence, apologized inside. The Prime Minister, realizing his assertions had ruined the mood of conversation, was also silent for a moment before apologizing into his cabinet. The room gr grew quiet until Nakasona cleared his throat, urging the men to settle their differences and began their work again in the interest of the Empire. Enough. Back to work. Always work. Endless work. And the provision or commissariat of Western Russia shut out the world. Selling off bits of Japan to to the natives, are you? I should have known you were no good in the first place. Why hitch my ship to yours is a mystery, Takagi. The room is boiling with tension. On one hand, Kido is barely containing his rage at Takagi for even considering the dismantlement of the colony. On the other hand, Nakasona and Zinjiro are trying to reel back the elderly noble inn. What they lack in charisma, they make up for numbers. Kido-san, it's no, it's no time to worry about honor, not especially when there's efficiency to worry about and profit to be made, said Nakasona. What do you know about national pride and honor, huh? I was in the diet when you were born, you uppity rascal. Takagi was silently across the whole exchange, and his eyes are stern, disappointed disappointment for men formed. Why do I have to come to this? May civility reign. Well, we'll see what happens. The Forge. Prime Minister, uh, we've already stated the obvious. It's simply not possible to go forward with these proposals, said one minister, while several others nodded in agreement. Gentlemen, I hope you understand the futility of your decision. The current administration cannot go on like this. As it sits around and grows lazy, our overseas costs rise every year, but the revenue we earn from these positions do not. It would benefit the main bureau as well to overhaul the local governments installed directly in the region, who will then allow us to push for development and in the long run greatly increase our yields while also improving the livelihood of the natives, said Takagi, confident in his speech. No, we won't continue to discuss this for much longer. It's dragged on and nothing more can be said, replied the opposition's leader. Fine. If you do not accept the full request, how about we compromise, said Takagi. While we shall not implement the strengthening of locally constructed governments, you must still support the rest of it. We will absolutely be expanding our lucrative businesses and our colonial possessions and strengthening Imperial imperial administrations in these locations and places like Chozon and Taiwan, said Takagi defiantly. Accepted. Now let us move on, said the opposition's leader. Takagi sighed a wreath of relief. Let us move on, indeed. That was a really fast exchange. <laughs> that was really fast. Kido's connections, and then Kato's blue blood. Uh. Shizu Kato appeared to be merely a meek activist on the surface, easily silenced by a few toko visits to her household and unwilling to get her hands dirty. The reality can be further from the truth. Kato has connections, large and small, across student leaders and even within the diet throughout her through her ex-husband, Baron Ishimoto. This presents us with a double-edged sword on one hand. It could make yielding to her proposed reforms a lot more palpable to members of the House of Peers, even given to the House of Representatives' reluctance. On the other hand, it also prevents us from fully acting out against her. Should we, should she evolve into a loose cannon, the connection she has makes it too risky for a public image. Pitch from the Yomi no Kuni. Huh. Takagi and the cabinet emerge from the boardroom exhausted and sweating, but prepared to set forth an era of colonial reforms. I love the description especially the resulting event. Cool. Using connections wisely. As Takaki's deputy, Kido worked particularly hard with making sure that the nobility remained supportive towards the Prime Minister. However, the Prime Minister's recent policy pushes would require all of Kido's connections and Gao to successfully sell it to the Kazoku. The prime duty Prime Minister's task would be to convince some more of the more conservative nobility of supporting Takagi. While he had no chance of winning them all over, there were some that he could be convinced to flattering conversation, and such Kido gathered his chosen candidates for lunch. Esteemed gentlemen, I am honored that you have accepted my invitation to lunch. While we could hardly refuse you when taking us to lunch here, Kido, this comment was met with polite chuckles from Kido and the rest of the nobles around the table. I hope whatever business you wish to discuss will not ruin this meal. I do understand it has something to do with the dreadful woman, Kato, yes? I'm afraid so, gentlemen. Yet yeah, I do ask that you hear me out. The Prime Minister has agreed to implement some of Kato's reforms, and he requires that your support to succeed. I understand that you are far from keen to see Kato get away, but this is a matter of saving the nation from disaster in the long term. These small reforms will pacify the student protests and restore order to the streets. Besides, most of the changes will go unnoticed by most people. They are mostly symbolic gestures that will ultimately protect national pol polity. It would have been incorrect to describe the assembled Kozaku, Kozaku as convinced. Kato could tell that he had not entirely won them over, but planted the seeds of consideration in heads. Uh, stressing the issue would not do any good. I do not need to hear a yes or no right now, gentlemen. Please, consider what I have said in your own time. Well, let us enjoy the rest of this luncheon. Forcing the nobility to act was unwise. It was better to give them the idea that they were working, or they were making, the decisions. Let us see where this brings us. I keep going back to the economy tab as kind of a, like a... A safety blanket, because I just want to see what could happen. Like, I just want more numbers. I want numbers. I want numbers. 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 I want to pay off the debt, which means nothing. I know that the debt means nothing at the time of this recording. But to me personally, I don't like having a lot of debt, so my nation should not have a ton of debt either. But that's just me. That's just me, you know. I keep opening up. I have a problem. I really have a problem with the economy tab. Cool. <clears throat> As you can tell, this is, this is a pretty long video, just because I want to push through this a little bit more quickly, or at least to get through more of the content. Brawl with the conservatives, though. 
Ikeda Manasuke's conservatives still remain the most num numerically powerful faction within the House of Representatives, and as such, he is an incredibly important power broker within the Diet. However, not all hope is lost. The conservatives are one of the more ideologically loose groups within the Diet, ranging from remnants of the old Sayukai and Min Iso. Min Saito parties to liberals who grew disillusioned with our clique. This leaves them ripe for assault and strong arming, and we would be wise to capitalize on this disunity. However, time has shown before that when the conservative centers laid siege to, they would turtle down harder and put aside their ideological differences temporarily. Negotiating with Ikeda for his support would require careful threading, as coming from a position that is too aggressive would consolidate the conservatives against their faction. So, Kato's counterplay. It had been some time since I Ishimoto Kaikichi had seen Kato in person. While they had remained fairly amicable over the years since this divorce, they usually spoke over the phone or through letters. This time, however, Kato had been adamant about meeting him in person. Ishimoto felt as if it was best to not to refuse and therefore invited her to meet him at his office in the Imperial Diet building. Kato was slightly surprised to see Ishimoto eating his lunch when she arrived. This was the only, this only time in my schedule that was open. Hopefully, you don't need too much time to say what you need to. I'm going to need a favor. I won't lie. It's quite a big to ask, question to ask, but I need you to do this. The old politician, the old politician side before finishing the food on this plate. Go on, then you might as well tell me what you want. As you know, the Prime Minister and I have come to an agreement regarding reforms to the Koku Min Yosai Ho. He is planning to move forward with these reforms and put them to a vote in the Imperial Diet. However, it's not clear how much support Takagi has had for this, so that's why I need your help. I think I see what you want. You want me to whip up independent support for the Prime Minister, correct? Kato gave a simple nod as a reply. Do you really think this is worth it? Some piecemeal reform to get the youth off the government's back for a few years? I need you to understand that this is probably the best shot we have of implementing some genuine reform. When was the last time we had a chance like this to make things better for so many people? At times like this, you're going to have to put away your distaste for the Prime Minister to achieve something good. Ishimoto remained silent for a few good seconds, but expression changed uh, to that of reluctant acceptance. Fine, I'll see what strings I can pull for you. You're going to need a lot of help to pull this off. She's wiser than we think. Just ask your ex-husband for help. right? Is That that, that was his ex-husband. Her His ex-husband? Her ex-husband, right? Ah, <sighs> Siberian Council. Sydney plays them. The tendency of military anarchism. Sounds a bit crazy, but let's see what could happen. Here's my security blanket. Not much there. Cool. And then we shall do the constitutional challenge. There's a disadvantage to using backroom politics as a means of achieving our aims, or achieving our aims, and that's how poorly what we propose would look when exposed to the light on the upper floor of the on the floor of the House of Representatives. Unfortunately, for all the backroom politicking, our legislation would take to garner support. It is useless without a deliberation and voting in the chambers of the House, even if it's only for show. This, in turn, risks our plotting be being barred for all to see in the chambers of the Diet, and it is easy opportunity for our opponents to attack our revised eugenics legislation as an affront to the ideas of IE, or the spirit of family system, which has been argued to con constitute part of the Kokutai. We should brace ourselves for any possible offensives using this method. It would de definitely pressure some of the most unflinching conservatives away from supporting our legislation. So, support of the House appears to Increases moderately, the reformist faction's power increases somewhat. So be it. Here we go. And we can close this again. And this doesn't seem like this is really changing too much, which is, which is a good thing. I'm expecting that we get some sort of event from the last spear, but okay, whatever. 11 days left, 10 days left, not bad. And then we shall do, and then what? Despite the air of confusion and disorientation over the past few months, there's one thing that the Admiral and the Cabinet have set their mind to. The repeal of the Koku Men Yosai Ho. While it's needed plenty of pushing and pressure from dissidents, student movements, and religious groups, the segment of Japanese society dedicated to repealing the laws finally gained a sufficient momentum to push for the goal. The question is, what would come in its place? Some have suggested that the redefining the law to include legalization of abortions, a radical move, but that one that will state the, the demands of the younger and more radical protesters. On the other hand, more moderate groups propose the expansion of state welfare for children as well as needs groups with special needs. Trouble in the West. Oh, now basically the same thing. Ger Germany marches against Switzerland. This is the first time this has ever happened in any of my campaigns. Like, Goring actually doing, like, stuff here. So, we'll do the same thing again. Why not? How many guns do we actually have, though? We don't have enough. Mm-hmm. So, let's take a look. Get more guns. Get more of this. Get more of that. Get more of this. We are actually making tanks now, which is kind of nice. And planes, too, so that's not too bad. We need more tactical bombers, though, which... No, thanks. We're good. Cool, so Kishi's a vehement opposition. The mood of the Imperial Diet was distinctly split as Kishi Nobusake. We prepared to address the assemble and politicians. Their opposition sat with eager looks on their faces, to, keen to hear Kishi speak. Those who were yet undecided on the matter of Koku Men Yosu, Yosai Ho were also keen to hear the reform bureaucrat speaking. Perhaps he could help them make up their minds. The Prime Minister and their supporters were less than enthused. Finally, Kishi stood up from his seat. Among the worlds of representatives, from its inception, I've been an opponent of the government. The ideological direction of the Prime Minister has swayed Japan off course and led us down into a shameful state. 
I had expected as much from this government, uh, but I had not expected them to now stoop even lower. In the face of protesting of students, the Prime Minister bowed his head in defeat. Kishi paused to allow his former or his fellow reformed bureaucrats to laugh for a few moments, keeping close eye to Kagi's facial expressions. As for the, what the Prime Minister is offering these students in the hopes of appeasing them, it is nothing short of gradual destruction of our society. This government will surrender the moral fabric of the nation under the guise of being diplomats and populists. Talks of reforming laws such as the Koku Men Yosai Ho violate the Koku Tai itself. This, of course, begs the question of how far this government is prepared to tear Japan apart. Will the Koku Tai be examined by commission? Will the Taisei Yoku Sankai be forcibly disbanded? I dread to think what will happen if the Prime Minister is not stopped. Those men in this room who still have your dignity, your morals, and your conscience. I ask you to vote against any proposed reforms through the Koku Men Yosai Ho. The very future of the nation is at otherwise risk. Kishi was met with great applause by his fellows as he sat down. Takagi did not notice this as he was more concerned with the conversations that the undecided representatives were having. You can hope they're not convinced. Ooh, and... Sure, why not? Why not? Level 4. Bargain with rubber. What is this? Ooh, there goes... Oh, no. Not Iraq. No. No, no, no. no. Please, not Iraq. Suez offer. Italian, Japanese, who are Bargain with rubber. Um, I'll probably just use console commands to get through that. Just because I want to see what's happened. What, what, what will happen if we select that. Because I don't know the next time we're going to play is Japan. I'm definitely going to be playing Japan after they actually update it. And... Oh, crap. No. Not the oil crisis. Oh, Black Sea, Red Sand. No, 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 no. And then what? Ooh. Do we get... We still have this here. Why is, we... Why is this still here? Huh. And then what? Despite the air of confusion and disorientation over the past few months, there's one thing that the Admiral and the Cabinet have set their minds to. Oh, wait, we already read this, didn't we? Yeah, we already read that. Why did it cancel? Uh, because of the, uh... The other stuff. Yeah. Oh, we have lost a few factories. Oh, no, please don't tell me this hurt us that badly. Please, 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 please. Oil crisis. No, no, no. Negotiating with activists. That's not great. Oh, we have the oil crisis. Oh, no, no, no. No, oh, please, no. Please, no. Oh, we are running it. Mm, 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 mm. Nope. Oh, my goodness. We actually... Oh, no. We gotta spend more. Okay, so now we have an annual deficit of $37 billion. That is not good. Okay, so at this point, we gotta do mass... Civilian factors. This isn't, this isn't going to really help all that much, but we got to do whatever we can to cut things. Oh, this is not good. This is not good. Oh, goodness. I just want to get below 600 billion. Jesus, help us. Help us. I will literally build on the islands here for any amount of money they can make. And we still own Hawaii, which is really nice. Alright, so the reason why I increased spending that much, because we only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Good, because we got to get as many as we can. Bringing Ikeda over. Oh, Prime Minister, you just don't understand, do you? You, I have a reputation. Ikeda stood on the opposite end of the boardroom from the Prime Minister with a hand in his pockets and the other waving a bell, exclaiming his reluctance to support Takagi's legislation in the diet. He was a conservative, and he stood against such sweeping reform. However, with such a precarious and uncertain political climate, Ikeda relied on stability even if it came from this Prime Minister. After what what felt like hours of tense reasoning, Takagi felt like Ikeda was on the knife's edge. With a bit of bartering, he could be convinced. The old man was wary of even mentioning any attempt to repeal the Kono-era law, and sighed out of frustration. Despite everything, Takagi's plan was the safest option for the stability of the nation. It's hardly religion, Ikeda. It's our last chance. There's no saying that Taisei Yoko and Sankai will survive if we don't pass this through. The old law will go, but the new one will fall in place. You have my word, the protections will stay in place. Ikeda slowly shut his eyes. He bit his lip and slowly nodded, his hands sinking to his sides as he visibly began to concede to the Prime Minister. Takagi approached him with a smile and patted him on the back, thanking him for his support. Ikeda shook his hand and made a point, noting that his support will disappear the moment legislation deviates from the proposed path. Takagi, assuring Ikeda, grabbed his hand and shook it firmly. With a tired smile, Ikeda shook it back and buried his hands deep in his pockets once again. Every man has a price. What a politician. Oh, we can't do that. So, untapped riches. The oldest colonies. Electrifying Taiwan would not be bad. We get more debts. Ooh, we get steel, but we need more problem. Oh, GDP growth. <gasps> Oh, realize we gotta do that one. Oldest colonies. While the colonies gained in the Second World War have been under hands for quite some time, our budgetary amounts for the maintenance and improvements have steadily gone down, especially since the start of the economic wars. Prime Minister Takagi is determined to bring both up living standards and generally quality of life for the citizens of these colonies. And this will, of course, be quite expensive. But it'll be a necessary one. Oh my gosh, that's painful. Hey, minus point six, though. All hands on deck. I was working at the time Takagi and the Prime Ministers, or the Ministers, reconvened in the former's office. Starting quite early in the morning, they all spent their day trying to gather every last scrap of support or influence they could collectively muster. Before they began their meeting, they had all taken, all taken a moment to breathe. When Kido and Hori Kiyuri had entered the office, they were too quiet, 
quite clearly out of breath. The three men sat down around Prime Minister's table, and the Takagi began by explaining what had managed throughout the day. The Prime Minister focused on his connections going among the Navy, hoping to limit their involvement in the matter or even get them to support him. Takagi had also worked to shore up the Liberal clique in the Diet to ensure that none of them had any sudden ideas about how to vote. When the, while the Prime Minister was not calling upon the largest pool of support, he was undeniably bringing in old allies that had always been fairly reliable. Takagi was therefore grateful for Hori Kiyoti and Kido, who had contacts of their own to call upon. As expected, Deputy Prime Minister Kido had contacted numerous members of the House of Peers as well as a few officials in the Imperial household. Meanwhile, the Hori Kiyoti had spent his time hunting down political allies in the House of Representatives. All this they told the Prime Minister who, while clearly listening, was locked in deep consideration before ending the meeting of the night. Takagi summarized his feelings on the matter. Even with all the allies we have gathered, the favors we have called in, and whatever other methods we have employed, it is not yet clear whether we can be sure of victory. This is the beginning of the job, and I do not suspect it will be much easier to finish. We have stabilized our foundations, but now we must build a high-rise. Let's hope this works. Once more, under the breach. Very, very good. Ooh, onto the breach. I would like to clear this government's efforts to approach the final repeal of the Koku Men Yosaho. Tagagi pushed a pause in his speech, gazing into the sea of bobbling heads that watched him from the chamber's floor. He had spoken for almost 20 minutes describing his new policy drive to the National Diet. His elucidations were clothed in a unique pragmatism. He was aware of the traditions and deputies he had to uphold as Prime Minister, but also conscious of the increasingly popular demands of the students who stood to protest in the streets again. Tagagi stood tall and firm, yet his words sallied over the heads of many sitting in the hall. It became more and more obvious towards the conclusion of the Prime Minister's speech that the Diet was split. Independents and Takitoites nodded and applauded the motions of the Prime Minister Takagi, hailing him as a wise and pragmatic mediator. The same could not be said for the reform bureaucrats and many of the conservatives that failed to die seats. As they shook their heads and audibly protested the speech with low groans and mumbles, as an empty applause sounded throughout the Great Hall. And, oh, an empty applause surrounded throughout the Great Hall from his podium, even with the supportive grins of all the allies in the Diet. It was clear that many would not even consider supporting him after voicing his intention to repeal the Koku Men Yosai Hope. The Prime Minister let out a retired sigh, bowing his head from behind the platform, and retreated back to his seat as the session continued. As expected. The oldest colonies. Ooh, I actually have more manpower for now. The White Queen's uh, consultation. Dagagi met with Kato and the Kato in the gardens, finally face to face with the woman he had a deep and personal hatred for. Now she was on his own estate, uh, and Takagi said. Feet stood a few feet away from her as she fiddled with her papers sprouted on the table. The Prime Minister had been discussing matters with her for a long while now, and they finally came to the topic of the repeal of the Koku Men Yosai Ho. Takagi was beyond arguing with her as they had for months now, and simply snapped at her that the Diet was not cooperating with any attempts to revoke the law. He spoke down to her, scowling with a necessity to appeal to conservatives and independents and the Taisei Yoko Sankai was their only hope to gain a majority. It was daunting to the Prime Minister. He found himself at a standstill. How could he convince moderates and conservatives to go in vote in favor of such a radical and liberal action? Kato turned to the Prime Minister after a brief moment, suddenly proposing a propose a counteroffer as Takagi pinched the bridge of his nose in an exhausted and defeated frustration. She mentioned to appease those who oppose the repeal. He could introduce legal protections, expanding state welfare, child care, and even legalizing abortion. Takagi looked up from his enraged despair with a confused smile as he wag wagged his finger at her smug face. He refused to show his excitement. He wouldn't give her the, the satisfaction of being right. As he quietly signaled a servant to get on the phone to Kido, Kato smiled and began to listen to the bird song of the gardens, finding peace in the Prime Minister's nonverbal gratification. Much to consider. Very much to consider. Can we ooh, increase special forces? I mean, this seems to be going on for the air boards. Actually, can we help out here? Okay, so we can't. I was hoping that we could not, so I don't get blamed for that, but whatever. Oh, they kind of like us in Kurdistan. The compromises, compromise. Prime Minister, what are you going to do with all this? In what was supposed to be a private conversation, Ikeda and Takagi argued in a boardroom with, in the National Diet building, and the two men accused each other of all kinds of political malpractice. After a particularly heated moment, Takagi ripped his brow and asked for Ikeda's honest opinion of the move to repeal the Koku Men Yosai Ho. Ikeda inhaled a large breath, and then relented, mentioning he was personally apath apathetic. What mattered, he insisted, was that the government had a system in place to defend the traditional morality of the nation. National eugenics law or not, Ikeda confessed, many conservatives would support a respectful homage to the traditions of the empire and the budget and government policy proposals. Nakagi? Nakagi? Takagi was silent, glaring at the man in confusion. Surely it was not that easy, he thought, in the denial of the whole affair. The Prime Minister, now at relative ease compared to the anger of the earlier argument, could not hide his astonishment, as he had the information he needed to get the conservatives behind a replacement bill. He still needed to wrestle with the legislature, but understanding that Takagi's platform on abortion and other issues gave him information key to drawing up a potentially successful bill in the diet. The question was, how much should he give him? We rule by our way, or not at all. The Jewel of the Empire, which we will talk about in just a little bit, and the Reproductive Rights Clause. Oh boy. 
Uh, Shizu Kato's works have been largely centered on the ideals of female self-determination and freedom of choice, and that message rings soundly clear within the minds of the Japanese populace. A philosophical point she has brought up in her own writings is how the Kokumen Yosai Ho, which acts or stands, allows for compulsory sterilization of certain groups, has not allowed for a mother to consent to an abortion even in life-threatening cases. Another issue that the Kato movement intends to address is the issue of sterilization. While these generally support the end of sterilization for patients of leprosy and for in inheritable conditions deemed undesirable by the public. Kato herself has been rather tightly lipped over the issue. She has made vague allusions to a broad revision of sterilization, but has not noted or supported any specific alternatives, a point of weakness which we can and should exploit to gain leverage over her. Yeah, we can't really... Looking at that is pretty much pointless at this point. The Jewel of the Empire. The girl knew what she was doing, and, and which was wrong, and that she would be in big trouble if she were to be caught. She saw what, she, that, what they did to her friend's parents over a stolen bag of rice. Yet the consequences of her failure only made her act even more thrilling. Right before the sunset, she began a great heist. She snuck through the window of the bathroom with a bit of noise, but nothing loud enough to give her away. For a moment, she doubted herself. What if she was really caught? What would they found her out her parents' names? What would they do to her family? Her mother always chastised her for antics, but her friends called her the monkey of Dapu. She grinned. She wouldn't dare let that reputation die now. She has, she'd have a prize for them yet. She slipped her way into the hallway, then the kitchen, and finally the living room. She looked around, and for a moment, in the darkness of the dimly lit room, she couldn't see anything there. It was hanging up from the wall, climbing atop a table with some effort to reach it. She seized it. Then a door slammed. Footsteps entered, echoed in the hall, and the girl's blood ran cold. She stumbled off the table and darted back the way she came into the bathroom, right out of the window, into some bushes. She sighed in relief, her heart pounding. Her heart pounding. She looked down at her prize. She wouldn't have giggled. She wouldn't giggle with joy if she weren't trying to be inconspicuous. Suddenly, or slowly, she slipped the blade away from its sheath. The last light of the sun. Tw tw twinkling off its shimmering steel. The Japanese so loved their swords, passing them down from one generation over the next hundreds, if not thousands of years. They cherished them as symbols of honor, a family of wisdom. In a way, they were the embodiment of Japan's glory and destiny to rule all the corners of the East. And now one was in the grubby hands of the monkey of Dapu. She couldn't help herself, she giggled. She couldn't wait to show her friends. In the pockets of the underdog. Man, that's not cool. Stealing from other people is not cool. Oh, look at all this we're building up, though. Especially something like a sword, a Japanese sword, man. Keep building, building, building. If we can do anything good, bring us below 73, 37 billion, that'd be nice. Yeah. Not even the military is... We're spending that much on the military compared to everything else. Ooh, construction pit. Civilian spending? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we can't do that one. Let's get some more rubber. Because rubber is always nice. Defense of the scouts. Actually, we got more than enough rubber, actually. We got a buttload of rubber. So much rubber. We're rubberinos. Minus 0.6. Actually, it hasn't gone down at all. It's not bad, actually. Actually, what's next? Not bad. Reproductive rights and a moral government, probably a conditional acceptance. Our conservatives have a promise to shore up support for our legislation with a few conditions, of course. Namely, they want conditions and strict licensing to regulate the practices of abortion as well as a sterilization debate ending in favor of pro-sterilization arguments. While many decry that the compromises are too far-reaching and making abortion borderline inaccessible to many who don't meet the prerequisites and licenses, we have deemed it to be a necessary sacrifice for us to push the general idea of the agenda while keeping the conservatives on our side. Nakasona emerges. After cabinet meetings dismissal, the ministers had made their way out of a boardroom in the National Diet building to gather in a nearby restaurant and have lunch together. They all hurried out of the room except for Nakasona, who spent some time wiping off the lint off his, over off his overcoat. Takagi stopped him once Kido had stumbled out of the door and asked the minister about his family and personal life. After a short but amiable exchange of conversation, Takagi brought up the recent move to repeal the Yoko Min Yosai Ho. To be totally honest, sir, I support the repeal as a better alternative to overbearing state power. It's not perfect, but all things considered, I think it's the best way forward. Nakasone nodded and spoke frankly to the Prime Minister after affirming his loyalty. Takagi, pleased to hear this, stood upright and proud to shake Nakasone's hand. In a political scene where the rivals critiqued him from all sides, the Prime Minister was pleased to know that his minister shared the same opinion as he did. He knew that this was expected of his own government, but was grateful nonetheless that he could find at least some peace being surrounded by his closest aides and colleagues. A surprising notion. And let's get through one more focus first before we shall end this long, long episode. I hope these guys actually win down here. Come on, West Russia. Do something. Do something. Zykov. And we kind of like him, too. 22. Yeah, these guys... Kind of formidable. Kind of formidable. I guess anarchism is yet to be extinguished. So be it. Oh, the Republic of Ukraine is here, too. Whoa! The Republic of Ukraine? Ooh, I don't know if Germany really likes that. Oh, they're by Yuri Horlis. And they have no focus tree, of course, which makes sense. But, hmm... We'll see what happens. Uh, once more into the breach. Takagi had emerged from the National Diet to discuss greater efforts to legislate and cover the mess caused by recent social upheaval. The eugenics protection law has government penned it, a bill drafted to be debated in the Diet and approved by the legislature, receiving loyal assent as soon as possible at the ASP. 
or to sap the magnitude of ongoing nagging protests. Outlining its provisions, the Prime Minister danced between his intentions and the law, finally mentioning its specific amendments to the status quo. The legalization of abortion as a medical procedure outside of necessity and continuation of the practice of sterilization in the medical facilities. The air in the chamber suddenly grew thick and tense as Kagi began to sweat with his, beneath the suit. He could feel his disavowing, uh, disapproving gaze from traditionalists in the diet prickling his skin. Hailing the potential of the legal recognition to bring positive social reform to the Japanese society, the Prime Minister continued his speech with a calm and cool composure, hiding his panic from political rivals. As soon as he began to finalize the clauses of the bill, Takagi's irritated eyes drifted over the seats on the right of the chamber. Dozens of conservatives had collected their belongings and attempted to leave the mid-session, clearly outraged at what the Prime Minister had presented to them. The Speaker called them back, but to no avail. Feeling powerless, Takagi stood behind his podium and stared into the thin air, tired of facing constant friction in his efforts to solve the Empire's troubles. Are we going to regret this? Maybe, but maybe not. And let's finish this episode with reading one more focus. Oh, we can't do that one. Always oh, false. Oh, so now either we win or we get it passed and we do well or we lose and we get the death knell. Oh boy. So how do we do this? Uh, as it is the House of Representatives that we need more support probably. So let's go ahead and do the chosen mining operation. Our GDP growth will increase. Our government is pointed towards possible excavation sites in the northeastern Chozon by eager geologists and businessmen. With millions of tons of magnesite, tungsten, and other, many other metals and natural deposits in the northern mountain ranges, we are presented with the opportunity to expand the mining operations already working the colony. Our potential to make or rake in immense profits from this operation cannot be ignored, and so we will begin working to expand the project and fill the mines with workers. Before long, heaps of metals and ores can be exported from the colony and sold throughout the empire, bringing great wealth and investment from the to the northern corners of Chosan, but hope you enjoyed today's longish episode. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we hopefully will watch Shorna bring Germany to do something. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.